Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Modafferi, Community Manager here at National Geographic Education. We're so excited to be supporting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants on this incredible all-day event celebrating amazing women in science and exploration. There will be 30-minute hangouts running all day, so check out exploringbytheseat.com to live stream more sessions after this one. So today, right now, I'm joined by Jamina Garland-Lewis. She's a, biolog excuse me, a biologist, photographer, and explorer with a background in conservation biology, global health, and documentary storytelling, and with experience in 29 countries across six continents. Both her research and her photography explore the myriad connections between humans, animals, and their shared environments. Welcome, Welcome. Jamina. We're so glad to have you. Thank you so much, Megan. I'm so glad to be here. And I also want to welcome all of our classrooms joining us on screen today, uh, and those of you who are tuning in through the live stream. If you're out there watching, you can get involved too. You can tweet questions for Jamina using the hashtag Let's Explore. So no apostrophe in there, that's just the hashtag L-E-T-S-E-X-P-L-O-R-E. -E -E. All right, I'll pass it to Jamina now and we can go ahead and get started. All right, thank you so much, Megan, and thank you to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants and to all of these classrooms here. I'm so excited to see you guys right now and to share the next half hour with you. Um, so just to uh, give a little bit of an overview, I think because we don't have a lot of time today, I'm just going to introduce the field that I work in um, and some of the projects that I work in and then the ways that I integrate photography um, with my work as a scientist. Um, and so the field that I work in is called eco health or one health. Um, and so I often describe myself um, as a photographer and an eco health researcher. And photographer is a little, I think everybody understands that part, but eco health researcher is a little new. And so what that means, um, with, whether we call it eco health or one health, is that I look at ways in which human health, animal health, and environmental health all are interconnected and how we can design research to acknowledge that these things are interconnected and work on win-win situations. Um, so some of the things that that means particularly when we're talking about eco-health is that we have a little bit more focus on the conservation biology side, the ecology, um, things like how climate change might affect changes in disease, how deforestation can alter the ways that people and wildlife or livestock interact with each other, um, what that might mean for uh, types of contact, which could change the way that disease uh, occurs between people and animals. And so with that, one of the things that we look at is zoonotic disease. And zoonotic disease is a term that just means that it's a disease that's able to be passed between people and animals. And so some of the things that you might know um, are rabies. I'm sure lots of people have heard about rabies. That's a zoonotic disease. Um, for those of you guys who are older, you might remember the Ebola outbreak that was happening in West Africa a few years ago. That's also a zoonotic disease. So th these are some of the types of things that I study as a scientist. Um, so other things that we can work on in One Health also are things like um, the human-animal bond which if any of you guys have a dog or a cat or a gerbil at home, you probably know and understand really well already. It's that type of special relationship that you can have with your dog or your cat that um, sometimes we don't always have with other humans, that really special type of friendship and um, what that means for our mental health and our physical health when we have that type of bond with an animal in our life. Um, we also look at things like uh, some of the relationships between different animals um, and people in terms of disease. So what can cancer in a jaguar help us understand about cancer in a human and how we can treat that? So there's all sorts of different ways um, that we look at this. Um, and so with that, I'm going to go over to screen share here to show you some photos of some of the work that I do. So, oh, let's see. We have a little system preferences thing going on. Um, 
All right, can you guys see that? Um, I saw it just a minute ago, uh, but now it's back to you. Okay, well. Take two. <laughs> Take two. Oh, I think, okay. Um, aha. I just need to authorize this, apparently. <laughs> um, Uh, sorry, everyone. All right, let's try that again. All right, how about now? Mm, no, not not this time. But it, it was showing right away the first time. That is you know, okay. You know what well, you did right in the beginning. Uh, yeah. It just it went into um, a system preferences saying that I had to allow uh, Google to do the screen share, hmm. uh, which I looks like I fixed. Um, but anything now? Yes, I see. Oh, yes, I see a monkey or a gorilla. <laughs> you see a gorilla? Okay, I'm gonna try and make the gorilla bigger. Great. <laughs> and can you see him now still? No, so let's just no. go ahead and do it a little okay. bit more. Well, it's still clear. Can you see him now, the gorilla? No, I think you're going to need to stop sharing and then just go back to it in the small okay. version. Okay, we will keep it there. Well, apparently slideshow is the issue here. Um, sorry, everyone. No worries. Technology, technology happens. Technology always mm -hmm. gets the best of us here. Um, all right. Okay, do we have a gorilla again? Yes. Perfect, okay. So um, so this gorilla, um, I photographed in Uganda about, oh, 12, 12 years ago at least. Um, and so this is the issue that I got into eco health with. And so some of the things that I talked about before, like rabies and Ebola, those are diseases that um, generally go from animals to people. And a lot of the times when we talk about zoonotic disease, that's what we think about. We tend to think, how is an animal going to make us sick? But it can happen the other way just as easily. Humans can make animals sick. And so this is particularly an issue for mountain gorillas. And they're a critically endangered species. There's only about 700 left of them. Um, and they live in this little patch of forest across three different countries in East Africa. And um, because gorillas are so genetically similar to humans, it means that it's really easy for them to get a human disease. So you could pass something like the flu onto a mountain gorilla if you had close contact with it. Um, and that can be a really big problem for them because even though they can catch a human disease, it's still something that we call novel to them. So it's new. They don't, their immune systems haven't developed with that, that virus um, over time. And so they don't have good immunity to it. So it can mean that they get a lot sicker with the same disease than a human would. Um, and for young gorillas, that might mean that they even have a higher chance of dying from that same illness. And so making sure that people who have contact with gorillas are healthy is a really key strategy to making sure that their population survives. And so I started working um, in 2007 with um, a woman named Dr. Gladys Kalima Zukusoka. Um, she's awesome. You should look her up for female scientists and explorers. She's a Ugandan veterinarian who started an organization um, called Conservation Through Public Health that really looks at 
ways that they can improve health in the people that surround this national park because there's a lot of close overlap um, between people who live near this park. And uh, I, this gorilla, I saw him walk right by the village outhouse, like within 10 feet. And so there's a lot of close overlap here. And so that's where these diseases are getting transmitted. And so this is really a great example of that win-win situation I talked about, where if you can promote the health of people in this region, that's great because we want to promote the health of people. Um, but that also means that you're making the gorillas healthier too by preventing some of that disease transmission that might happen. The healthier the gorillas are, the bigger their population. That means that more money is going to come in through tourism to see them in the wild. And that money directly goes into the national park system and ways that uh, we can continue working with conservation in these areas. So it's really a win-win on all sides. Um, and so this is really where I got um, fascinated by this field and really understood its importance. And so then I spent the next four years um, traveling, working on different projects, um, but always sort of coming back to this, uh, this concept of One Health. And wherever I went, so this is in Japan, um, in a city that just has deer everywhere, um, I was always thinking about this. I was always thinking about um, what are the different ways in which humans and animals interact and connect and what are some of the um, really amazing things about that? What are some of the potential risks about that? Um, and I ended up going to graduate school uh, specifically for this topic. Um, and then uh, have for the last three and a half years been working at the Center for One Health Research at the University of Washington, where we focus on these research, issue, research issues. Um, so some of the things that we look at are um, occupational health of people who work very closely with uh, with animals. So whether that's wildlife or with livestock, we have a long-term study on dairy farmers in Washington State, where we sort of look at what are some of the shared types of bacteria that uh, the workers share with the cows or the environment, and what might that mean for their health. And again, sometimes um, that could mean it's a risk. Maybe there's a disease that could get transmitted but also more and more we're understanding that there are positives to having this type of animal um, exposure. It can help introduce new uh, bacteria which give us better diversity, um, which can help improve our immune systems. It's something we call the hygiene hypothesis, that it's okay to get a little bit dirty, that it might actually be beneficial to our health to not be super clean all the time. Um, one of the other more recent projects I've worked on is microplastics collection. Um, and I sailed from Southern California down to the tip of Baja with uh, some friends and fellow explorers, and we did water samples the whole way to help researchers who are looking at microplastics pollution better understand where they are. And uh, microplastics can impact uh, the marine life um, that lives with them or that consumes them uh, really severely, and in turn that can impact the humans that uh, eat those fish or that live in those water and live near those waters as well. Um, human animal bond, this is a thing that I mentioned before. So uh, we have a project specifically looking at human animal bond for people who are experiencing homelessness in Seattle and what that means um, when you're going through something like that. And it's partnered with um, more work on the clinical and community side to increase veterinary care and medical care for people who are uh, living on the streets in Seattle. Um, we work a lot with the zoo as well. So um, I don't know if anyone can tell what this is, but this is a gorilla getting its fingernails clipped. And so again, looking at some of these ways that uh, humans and animals do share a lot of the same similarities. So this gorilla was getting his uh, five-year exam. There are veterinarians in the room and there are human cardiologists who study hearts in the room because the gorilla's heart is so similar to a human. So this is a joint effort of, of both uh, human and animal doctors to, to check on this gorilla. Um, some of the other stuff we look at is, again, like people who work with animals or who work with wildlife um, what are some of their risks? So we just published a paper on this, uh, came out just a few days ago actually, um, about people who for their living go and sample sick wildlife 
um, to try and figure out um, what diseases they have and what that might mean for humans. Um, we also look at how people who, uh, children who grow up really close with livestock, who start tending livestock at a young age, what that might mean um, for what we call their microbiome. And their microbiome is all of the bacteria that lives on us and in us. Um, and we're actually, we have more bacteria cells than we have human cells in our bodies, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, but it means that we really exist because of the bacteria that live with us and all of the things that it does for us. So when we talk about our gut microbiome, uh, all the bacteria that live in our stomach, um, that helps us digest everything, that helps us absorb nutrients. So it's a really big deal in looking at things like malnutrition. So we are interested in how uh, tending livestock from a young age might impact what type of bacteria you have in your belly and what that might mean for your childhood nutrition. And then just wrapping up here, um, so we can get to the Q&A, as I mentioned, one of the things that's really important to me is to uh, merge my work as a photographer and a scientist. Um, and I think that it's really important to have better science communication, to engage people who aren't scientists and the really cool things that are going on in science and research. A lot of the times it's hard for people to engage with scientific research, sometimes because like those articles that I just showed you, if you're not a scientist, you might not even have access to be able to read those articles because we often only give access to people who work at universities. Um, but even if you had access, uh, they're written really technically, and if you don't work in that field, it might be really hard to understand. But there's really cool stuff going on and being talked about in those articles. So I see photography as a way to help bridge that gap in science communication. And so I want to work at that interface of photography and visual storytelling and science communication and education, where I can really understand um, you know, the, the impacts of both worlds and find a way to, to promote them so they help each other out. Um, so as I talked about the project on homelessness, this is just an example um, of an educational website that I've built surrounding the issue um, so that people can, uh, as this page shows, get to know someone and their story, um, learn more about their community, learn more about the issue, um, some of the research that we've done related to this, um, and, and so this is really where a lot of my work in the future is focused on, is bridging that gap between science and photography and building new educational tools at that interface for people like yourselves in classrooms or the general public to have a better understanding of these One Health issues and to engage with it in a more exciting uh, way, like photography um, and visual storytelling. So with that, I'm going to come back to you guys here, um, if I can figure that out, <laughs> uh, and then we can go, okay, that, um, go into some Q&A about whatever sounds most interesting there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jamina. That was a really cool whirlwind tour of the exciting projects that you've worked on. Um, all right, so I'm going to start going through the classrooms to let them ask some questions. Uh, let's go first to Mr. Garcia's class, uh, and we'll take two questions from you. So uh, go ahead if a student would like to come up. Oh, you. There you, you go. Hear us? Yes. Okay. So one of the kids had a question about what um, she did in school to get to prepare her for uh, this career. What did she do in elementary, high, and even in college? What was oh. her like? They're starting young. Okay, so um, I Your went... first graders here. All right, you guys have a bright future ahead of you. <laughs> um, so I, um, let's see, I spent most of high school in the dark room. I've been a photographer since I was 12, so I kind of was a little bit more secluded, um, but I was also in high school getting really into... Um, into biology and so I was doing advanced courses in, in biology and realized at that point that um, if you want to work in photography 
it's possible to do that. And in fact, many people who are incredibly successful in photography don't have a formal education in photography. Um, uh, whereas with biology or with science in general, that's not really the case. Um, you can't really get a job in science if you don't have an academic background in science. And so when I was looking at colleges, I ultimately decided that I would go to school for biology and just continue my photography, developing my photography outside of, of my formal education. And so my undergraduate degree is in biology and environmental studies. Um, and then I had a fellowship the year after I graduated um, called the Thomas J. Watson Fellowship where I spent a year traveling to seven different countries to look at different cultural connections and histories with whales. And so I was looking at whaling communities, um, past and present, um, whale researchers, spiritual ties to whales. Um, and that was another thing that really got me developed on this track. And then my graduate degree is in conservation medicine, which is another term for eco health um, to sort of further specifically that aspect of of what I'm interested in biology. So, great, thank you. How about one more from Mr. Garcia? Side? Okay, go ahead. What was the funnest place you saw a whale? Ooh, the funnest place I saw a whale. Hmm. I think that that would have to be South Africa. So, in South Africa, there um, is a really cool part on the western coast where the because of the way that the kind of the sea cliffs there drop off really quickly, um, it means that the water is really deep, really close to shore. And so the whales come really close um, and it's a protected area. So you can actually kayak um, in that, that no boats are allowed, which is really something special. Um, and so I got to kayak with these whales. Um, and one time while I was out there, there was a whale that actually came up to breathe right under another kayak and it just you there's a picture of this kayak kind of balancing on this back of a whale and then the whale comes back down and the kayak just gets set back on the water nobody fell out nothing happened but that was a pretty crazy experience Awesome, thank you. All right, thank Mr. Pennington's class, I'm gonna turn on you guys' mic and we can grab two questions from you. All righty. Okay. Right now? Yeah. Yes. Hi. 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 Um, I'm Erin. Hi. Um, I was wondering, maybe while you were in school, what was like your main inspiration or what sort of like triggered your idea to go into science mm. it's just so cool I don't know <laughs> like, um, it's I love understanding the way that things work and I think that um, knowing more about how things work in in our bodies or um, in the environment to me I think like that makes it so much more exciting um, to think of all of these, all of these little things that are going on to make us uh, have this conversation right now, or to breathe the air we do, um, and that's just always, you know. I guess maybe I'm a nerd, but I like it, and um, it's okay to be a nerd, and <laughs> you should always follow your nerdiness and your excitement. And so, um, yeah, I think just the more that I had science education, the more I learned about biology. Um, it was just so fascinating to me and, um, you know, that's, I just wanted to learn more. So that's basically it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Corey. It's great to see you. Hi, Corey. We viewed your website the other day and we saw your photography, which was amazing, by the way. So I was Thank wondering, you. what do you think is the most beautiful spot that you've photographed? Ah! <laughs> um, <laughs> oh man, you're gonna have me think on that one, Corey. Um, there, I I don't know if I can can pick an answer to that. I think one thing that's really um, really uh, interesting as a photographer, and it, it, when you're talking about 
your own work too. So the picture that I have on my homepage um, of my website of the really beautiful light filtering through the waves, um, that's a really special, really special picture where I was in my own life when I took it and the person I was with and a lot of other things that don't necessarily have anything to do with the final image itself. And so that can always be hard for a photographer to separate um, what you really uh, appreciate in your work and what's really beautiful um, just aesthetically as a photograph from what you were experiencing on the other side of that camera personally as well. Um, and so I think everything is all wrapped up in that um, as a photographer. Um, what you were going through makes the place more beautiful or less beautiful in addition to you know, how nice the light was um, or how great a photograph you ended up getting from it. So um, there's lots of moments I've been really, really privileged and I'm really grateful to, to have experienced lots of beautiful places around the world. But there's a reason that that particular photo ended up on my homepage. It's because of the personal side of it as well. Thank you. Great Thank question. You. Great question. Um, so we, um, so uh, we oh, I think oh, I have an echo. Here we go. I think that should get rid of it. Um, so we are running a little bit low on time. So I'm just going to take one question from the next three classes because I want to make sure everyone has time to ask a question. So I'm going now to Mrs. Campion and Miss Logan's classes. Hi, I'm Trent, and it's so cool to meet a real scientist, by the way. Um, but my question was, what's like any good advice for good advice for breaking the poverty? End of that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, um, okay, I'm sorry. It's cutting out towards the end. I can't hear the end of the question. Go ahead and try one more time. What's the best advice for breaking into photography? Okay. Um, okay, cool. Thank you. Um, for, I would say the most important thing is to just get out there and start shooting. Um, like I said, it's, it's something that you can have a formal education for, but um, it's also something that you can really, it's more accessible to teach yourself. And it's, it takes time um, uh, to start recognizing, um, let's see, uh, you know how to take a good photo and what goes into a good photo um, and that's just a lot of trial and error for um, at the beginning and so just with whatever camera you have it doesn't matter um, what you start shooting with um, that can come later but just start learning about photography um, by shooting it's something where you really learn by doing um, get yourself on the ground get yourself up high in a chair trying new angles of looking at things. Um, think about um, how the uniqueness of your own story and your own experiences can help uh, lend a different perspective that somebody else couldn't um, and help try and promote that in your work as you're shooting. Great. Thank you. Um, so now I'm going to go to Mrs. Castell's class. Hi, thank you. What is the only continent you didn't go to, and are you going to go? <laughs> uh, excellent question. Um, the only continent I have not been to yet is Antarctica, um, and that is definitely a yet because I would really love to go to Antarctica. Um, so I'm still figuring that one out, but hopefully you'll see me having gone there someday soon. <laughs> All right, great. And now we'll go to Mrs. Finkelberg's class. Hi, I'm Miriam. Um, is it difficult having um, many professions? <laughs> oh, that's a that's a big existential question, there, Miriam. Um, <laughs> there are. I think with anything, there's ups and downs to um, to the type of profession that you end up having, if you have one or if you have lots. Um, 
the type of profession that I want to do doesn't really exist. Um, and so I work in multiple professions so that I can kind of create what it is that I really want to do. Um, and for some people, maybe what they really want to do already exists, and that might be a little bit easier on them, I'm sure. Um, but there's a lot of us who are trying to um, create new things, uh, new ways of educating or engaging new things that photography can do, new things that can, science can do, um, bridging gaps, uh, bringing together fields and professions that haven't historically worked together um, because they can improve the benefits of both. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes it's a little bit frazzling and I uh, get spread too thin, And um, but I know that I'm doing what I want to be doing. Um, and so at the end of the day, that's the important part um, that I'm following what I want to do, even if it doesn't really exist. And it means that I'm sleepy sometimes um, rather than kind of putting myself in a box of, of one or the other. Awesome. Well, from all of us here at Nacho, I want to send a big, big thank you to our fabulous explorer, Jamina Garland Lewis. This has been really wonderful, and we really appreciate you sharing your stories with us and answering all these great questions. Speaking of the questions, thank you to all the classrooms who sent them all in on Twitter and who shared them live with us today. Uh, we really appreciate the thought you put into them. You guys are you guys are very smart. Um, and finally, thank you to Joe Grabowski and his organization, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, for hosting this event and organizing this event. If you're interested in watching more Hangouts like this with amazing women in science and exploration, visit exploringbytheseat.com. We've got Hangouts going today from now until 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so there's a lot more that you could see. And if you liked this, you'll also like National Geographic Explorer Classroom which is a program that Joe Grabowski hosts through National Geographic. Teachers, if you're interested, go to natgeoed.org slash Explorer Classroom to learn more. Okay, so in a minute now, I'm gonna turn on all the classes mics and give you guys a chance to say goodbye and say thank you. So I wanna hear from every single student out there. So in just a minute, here I go, we're gonna turn on the mics and I wanna hear from you. Yep. Yep. <laughs>